Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. So today we continue to move through our sermon series in Hebrews, and I think it's been an amazing and fruitful and encouraging series. Now today we're going to be looking at Hebrews 12, 3 through 17. Now before I get into it, I want to do a little refresher from last week. You know, last week we looked at the race, running the race that was set before us, the race of our faith, our salvation. Our faith is a lifelong undertaking, right? The Christian life is a life of endurance. And we as continuously as Christians are being sanctified day by day. And it is a long, slow, and oftentimes painful process but it's needed. And last week we also got into uh, Jesus being the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And it also spoke about Jesus enduring the cross for the joy that was set before him. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now we're going to get back to verse 2 in a little bit because verse 3 rolls right, right, right off of that. Now before we get into this though, I want to ask you all a question. Have you all thought of the discipline of the Lord? Has it crossed your mind? And I ask that because as we, we, read, we uh, heard from the, the scripture reading, much of today is based on the discipline of the Lord. And I, So I just want to get you all thinking about that, the discipline of the Lord and have you actually thought about it? Now we know as Christians that discipline is so important for our walk. It might hurt, and it often does. Knowing the Lord disciplines us, however it is needed, much like I said in the prayer, discipline of our own children is needed. And we're going to get back to this in a little bit. So let's get into our text. Uh, verse, <clears throat> verse 3 says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility, against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The author is now telling the readers, remember the Jewish Christians, to consider Jesus who experienced all the hostility that the author spoke about in, in verse 2. Remember he said, uh, he endured the cross despising shame. <clears throat> He's saying to these Jewish Christians to consider him. Consider the man who experienced the ultimate persecution Now, you might be wondering, what does it mean to consider him? Now, that's actually in reference to using Jesus as an example of running the race, running the race of endurance to the end. Jesus saw these hardships and trials that he went through in his earthly ministry as a part of God's plan. As a matter of fact, right before his death on the cross, when he was praying to the Lord, he says this in Luke 22, 42, he says, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He knew it was the will of the Father for him to endure this hardship, this intense trial he was about to experience, the brutal death on the cross. He knew that it was coming and it was the will of the Lord. And Jesus was the perfect example of being faithful to the end to those Jewish Christians thousands of years ago And he's the perfect example to all of us sitting in here today. The author wants us to take the same approach to how Jesus handled the trials and tribulations that he went through. Christ handled it knowing the joy that was set before him. He knew that he was about to experience something so difficult, but the joy on the other side was what he was looking towards. The writer of Hebrews wants his readers to take that same approach, and we should as well. 
the joy that is one day we as believers will be, be with Christ for eternity. We'll be ruling and reigning with him for eternity. When we are going through tough things in our lives, focus on the joy that is set before us. <clears throat> one day we'll be walking in the cool of the breeze with God the Father, much like Adam and Eve did, and we all know what happened with them. So I say to you, realize these trials and tribulations and these things that you are going through, that they are a part of God's plan. Realize this is the will of the Father. And again, just consider Jesus. Don't grow weary and faint-hearted. Consider Christ. So moving on to verse 4, the writer says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The author shifts back to the Jewish Christians he was writing to. He's reminding them that, one, Jesus committed no sin, and yet he still shed his blood. He was sinless, he was spotless, and endured the most brutal death in history. And he's also saying to these, these readers, he's saying, that yes, while you are being persecuted, you have not gotten to the point of shedding your blood. You haven't gotten to the point of resisting. He says, not yet, though, indicating that things can change. Persecution was ramping up for these Christians, as we know. But they weren't being martyred yet. And the author wanted them to know that shedding their blood for Christ is a real possibility. And it can happen at a moment's notice. Another thing the author is making them and us aware of is that the thought of falling away when things get tough is submitting to sin. Al Mohler says this about this temptation of falling away. The temptation to avoid persecution or to abandon the faith is ultimately the temptation to submit to sin. Remember back in Hebrews 6, we had a whole sermon on falling away, the apostasy. These Jewish Christians wanted to go back to Judaism because it was safe for them, but Christianity was not. And back in Hebrews 6, he's saying, if you go back to Judaism, there is no restoration for you. You are walking away from the Christian faith. You are putting your faith and hope in Old Testament things and Jewish rituals and turning your back on Christ. And in doing so, you are falling away from the faith. You are turning your back on Christ. And that's why the author is urging these Christians to consider Jesus. Consider the one who endured such a brutal death, and he did it knowing it was the Father's plan, and he also did it for the joy of that was set before him. And the author definitely makes, it, makes the readers aware that he wants them to think the same way. He's saying it's hard, yes, I know, but embrace the persecution. And he's reminding them to hold fast to their faith and to not apostatize. Now bringing this back to all of us sitting here today, the message is the same for us. We haven't and are not resisting to the point of shedding our blood for our faith in this country. We don't really know what persecution's like in this country. We, have, we are lucky to have lived and continuously live in this country. We've enjoyed so many religious freedoms that many in other countries never have and don't have. Many of them are being martyred for their faith. <laughs> However, we'll say this, lately we have seen a shift and how Christianity in this country is beginning to be less and less tolerated. The separation from us and the world are going much farther apart. And this country is growing increasingly more hostile towards Christianity. So my point in, here, my point in telling you all this here is that we should expect persecution to ramp up. Like the author was telling the writer of Hebrews, or the author was telling the Jewish Christians back then. We should be ready for that. At a moment's notice, it could change. You get the wrong leader in there, it could change. We could begin shedding our blood for our faith. We learned earlier in Hebrews that the, a lot of the heroes of the faith suffered excruciating deaths. Some of them were stoned. Some of them were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They were mocked, flogged, imprisoned, afflicted, and mistreated. Now, I'm not saying this exact type of persecution is coming to America, but we need to realize 
that we have seen persecution rise towards Christians in this country. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to us. And when persecution does increase, do what the author says and consider Jesus. Consider what he did on the cross and consider that he did it for the joy of the will of God. We should be the same way. Do it for the joy set before us. Again, the joy that is spending eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we move into the next few verses, the author really does get into the discipline of the Lord, his discipline. Verses 5 and 6 says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Here the author pulls in moral testament verses. This has been a theme we've seen all throughout the book of Hebrews. He loves pulling from the wisdom literature. And here he's actually pulling out verses out of the book of Proverbs. And I forgot to write it down. (laughs) Now, if if you're not familiar with this particular proverb, though, Solomon here is telling his son to not take the discipline of the Lord lightly. He says, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. He's also reminding him that the discipline of the Lord is a good thing. It shows the love of the Lord for his children. He says, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So the author, the author is, pulls this in because the readers really did forget the exhortation that address them as sons, the exhortation that is Proverbs. They were growing weary and faint-hearted because of the persecution they were enduring. And he wants, his re- he wants to remind his readers that everything they're experiencing, all the trials and tribulations, all the hardships and persecutions are indeed the will of the Father and attributed to the discipline of the Father. That's why he goes on in verse 7 to say this. It is for the discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Discipline is the reason the readers have to endure to the end, and it's also the reason we have to endure to the end as well. Our Father in heaven loves us so much that he wants to discipline us. He realizes we need his discipline. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says this, and just as Jesus speaking to the church of Laodicea, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Discipline from the Lord is a good thing. And like Jesus said, repent. Because his love shines through his discipline. It doesn't feel like it at the moment, but it does. Scriptures are very clear on that. He disciplines the ones he loves. <clears throat> League of Air Ministries says this about God's discipline. God the Father imposes discipline upon us when we sin. This can include anything from awareness of our sin and guilt to letting us suffer the earthly consequences for our sin. No matter what the discipline imposed, the Lord also has, a, as is his goal, our maturity. He is working through everything, every possible means to present us mature in Christ. So there's an end goal to his discipline to bring us to maturity, to sanctify us, to bring us closer to Christ. And as the article said, to present us mature in Christ. You know, we, we can see his discipline throughout the Bible too. All the covenants he made with his people, Adam, Abraham, Moses, and so on. He gave that a set of commands to obey. <laughs> If they obeyed, they were experienced blessings. However, if they disobeyed, they were experienced his discipline. He told Adam, do not eat from the forbidden tree. They did anyways, and what happened? Adam and Eve were casted out. The Israelites disobeyed God's covenant commandments, and they were exiled for it. And the list goes on and on, showing his discipline. They were his people, and he loved them, and he had to discipline them. So what happens if we're left without discipline? 
verse 8 tells us, if you are left without discipline in which, you, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The author here likens those who have not been disciplined by the Lord as illegitimate children and not sons. The author is saying, if you are truly saved, if you are truly a child of God, you will be disciplined by him. However, if you haven't been disciplined by the Lord, you are not a part of his elect. You are not a son, he says. Thomas Schreiner says this about this, what we just read. No true son, no genuine child is spared by the father. If discipline is withheld, it indicates that one doesn't belong to the family at all. That one is an illegitimate child. And how do we know this? Because again, the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. I know it sounds repetitive, but <laughs> the scripture is filled with that. What kind of father would he be if he did not discipline us? If he let us do whatever we wanted, let us go about sinning without repercussions. What kind of father would he be? He needs to discipline us and we need his discipline. He does it to draw us back to him and to make us mature for Christ. And understand he does all of this for our good as well. Romans 8 Chapter, verse 28 says, And we know that those who love God, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for his good. For those who are called according to his purpose. The Lord calls us, the Lord elects us to his, according to his purpose. We have a change of heart. We in turn love him. And as all this plays out, all these things we experience as children of the Most High are then being worked out for our good. And that, yes, includes his discipline. That includes all the trials we're going through, all the tribulations we're going through. All these things are being worked out by the Lord for our own good. And that shows the sovereignty of God. He is in control every step of the way. And that's something we should take extreme comfort in. No matter what we are going through, the Lord is in complete control and he's working, out for, working it out for our own good. And you know, there's oftentimes, and I, I've done this a lot, I blamed a lot of stuff on the enemy, a lot of stuff on Satan. And I've said, the enemy is really bringing me down, he's dragging me down. He's attacking me. And while that is true, yes, we also need to realize that Satan is only allowed to do what the Father allows him to do. And this goes back to the sovereignty of God. The enemy could be coming after you. And yes, he does. But the Lord is in complete control. He ordains everything. Amen. And if the enemy, amen, yes. And if the enemy is coming after you, the Lord is allowing it for a purpose. He's sovereign over it. He's in control. And as Paul said, he's working out an attack from the enemy for your good. Saints, just take comfort in that. Don't question the sovereignty of the Lord. Take comfort in it. Take comfort in knowing that when the enemy is after you and you're feeling attacked, take comfort to know that, yes, the Lord is allowing it, but he's working it out for your good. It feels hard, yes. <laughs> I know it does. Rest in the truth, though, that he is in control of it and he's working it out working all things out for the good. Now in the next few verses, the Lord is contrasting earthly discipline with heavenly discipline. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10 says, Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we have respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the, to the Father of spirits and lives? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. We all have earthly fathers, of course. And if your father is or was a part of your life, I'm sure at some point there was discipline along the way. And of course, at the time, you didn't, we didn't understand it. You never understood why the, your father was disciplining you. And of course, at the time, you hated it. You despised it. I know I did. But as you grow older, you learn to respect and appreciate your father's discipline. Oftentimes, 
our Father's discipline can keep us from going down a bad path. And the author here is saying that if you respect your earthly father for disciplining you, if you see the benefit of earthly discipline, you should certainly be much more receptive to the discipline of the Lord, the discipline of our heavenly father. And this rolls right into verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. This is where the big difference between the Lord's discipline and our earthly father's discipline separates. Our earthly father disciplines us as it seemed best to them. This type of earthly discipline is often well-intentioned, but as we know, it's far from perfect. Oftentimes, earthly discipline from our fathers is what our parents think is best for us, but it's not always right and it's not always what's best for us. However, our Heavenly Father knows exactly what is best for us. The text says his, He disciplines us for our good and that we may share in His holiness. God's intentions are to make us more like Him, to share in His holiness. And this is the part of our sanctification. His discipline sanctifies us so we are made more mature for Christ. Now, don't look to the Lord disciplining you as him hating you. No. Look to his discipline as a sign of his love towards you. And in the next verse, the author says this, and this is in response to discipline. Verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here the author says, discipline yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. That's in reference to holiness. Discipline yields the fruit of holiness. I know I said this earlier, we hate discipline at the moment it's happening. That's what the author here says too. The author says it isn't pleasant. It's often painful. It feels like you're being crushed. It hurts. But think of it this way. You know, believe it or not, about 10 years ago, I lost over 100 pounds. And let me tell you, in the moment as I was losing the weight, it hurt. The exercise hurt. It was uncomfortable. I remember I was working 10 plus hours a day and then going to the gym Monday through Friday. It wasn't easy. I did that for two years before I hit my goal. But let me tell you, when I saw the weight coming off and my health improving, I realized there was a purpose behind it, and I realized these work yields results. The same can be said about our faith. As we endure God's discipline, our faith in turn grows and strengthens. We grow more mature in Christ. And as I said earlier, we are continuously being sanctified. <clears throat> we are continuously being sanctified by the Lord. And that sanctification, like the author Hebrew says, is painful and slow, but for our own good. Now the last couple of verses, the author builds out the discipline we just saw. It's an exhortation of sorts. He's telling the readers what they need to do in the face of trials in the Lord's discipline by using metaphors. Verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Interestingly enough, the author here goes back again to the Old Testament and and draws a parallel here with Isaiah 35, 3. It says, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. This was showing Israel's return to Zion after their exile. The author's using this metaphor to encourage his readers to strengthen themselves in the race that God has set before us. Remember, according to verse 3, they were, fearing, they were feeling weary and faint-hearted. They were discouraged. And the author wanted to encourage them with this exhortation. He's telling them that through the hardships and the Lord's discipline to strengthen yourself. He's telling them to turn away from your fear, their fear of persecution they were enduring. He's telling them to be courage, courageous and hold fast to the Lord in these tough times. And then he says, make straight paths for your feet. And he says that so when we are running this race that the Lord has set before us, that not much can cause us to stumble. 
when we are on a straight path, when we're on a path focused on the Lord, when we're on the path that the Lord has set before us, our faith can and will be strengthened. And that's what he's telling these, that's what he's telling these people. He's saying, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths. Stay on the path of righteousness. <clears throat> now verse 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It's interesting here that the author tells the readers to strive for peace. Kind of seems out of place, doesn't it? We've been hearing about the discipline of the Lord, and then all of a sudden we talk, he's talking about striving for peace. You know, we see the Lord's discipline throughout strengthening our faith, and then slaps striving for peace right in the middle of it. But when we look at the context here, it actually fits perfectly. Along our walk, as we are running the race of our faith with endurance, Seeking peace with everyone is vitally important. Seeking peace with everyone is an essential part of righteousness, an essential part of our holiness. Paul actually tells us this in Romans 12, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul, and the author of Hebrews, wants the readers and us to live peacefully with everyone. Notice what's with everyone. It's not just with believers, but everyone we come across, we should strive for peace with. Unbelievers included. How are we going to share the gospel if we're not striving for peace with unbelievers? How are we supposed to fulfill the Great Commission if we aren't, <clears throat> if we aren't striving for peace with unbelievers? Now, of course, not everyone we come across and our walk with the Lord is going to bear peaceful fruit, right? But as Paul says, so far as it depends on you, we need to be doing our part to live peacefully with everyone. And what happens when, he, when we strive for that? He finishes off the verse by saying, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. He's again putting an emphasis on holiness. Striving to live peacefully with everyone will continue to make us holy. It will continue to sanctify us. It will help grow our faith and be more like Christ. So when Christ comes back or you die, when you meet him, you're going to be just like him. And this is all important because he says if you aren't pursuing holiness, if you aren't pursuing righteousness, if you aren't pursuing the Lord, you won't see the Lord. This is yet another warning from the writer of Hebrews. As a believer, you are required to be holy, and he's making it known to his readers. Again, falling away is not a part of holiness. Reverting back to Judaism because of persecution is not holy, but seeking the Lord and pursuing the Lord day in and day out in your walk is holy. Folks, pursue the Lord. Pursue righteousness. Pursue holiness on your walk. It is essential to our walk. <clears throat> so as we move into the next two verses, the author commands us to make sure others do not fail to obtain the grace of God. He says this, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Now the author here is saying that it's actually... Partly our responsibility to seek that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. This is another part of our pursuit of holiness. <clears throat> Thomas Schreiner again says this about verse 15. Continuing on the right pathway and pursuing holiness are not optional. <clears throat> Excuse me. According to the author, life and death are at stake. Hence, believers should watch over one another exhorting one another not to, not to fall short of the grace of God. Those who fall short commit apostasy since they don't continue in the grace of God. Schreiner again makes the case, that as, as the author does, that it is our responsibility to make sure people obtain the grace of God. Yes, there's a personal responsibility, but as a church, we need to be looking out for one another, and that's what the author says, that's what Schreiner says. 
<clears throat> the author again actually goes goes back to the Old Testament and draws a clear reference from Deuteronomy 29, verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribes whose heart is turning away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and bitter fruit. One, when he, one, wait a second. Yeah, sorry. One who, when he hears the word of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the most stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. What's happening in this text? Well, the people of Israel were turning away from God. They were worshiping other gods. They were abandoning the Lord to worship these other gods. And they were thought they were safe from God's judgment. And Moses says, not so fast. It says, by you turning away from the Lord, you have fallen away from the faith. You are not secure from the judgment of God. <clears throat> you may be asking why the author is making a reference to Deuteronomy. Well, let's first understand that this bitterness described that the author of Hebrews is writing about is actually metaphoric of something poisonous, as Moses said in Deuteronomy. The, poisonous, the poison that is bitter fruit. The writer of Hebrews was afraid that his readers were, again, going to do the same thing that the Israelites did in Deuteronomy. He was afraid these bitter roots were going to cause defilement. <clears throat> he was worried that some were going to give themselves over and fall away from the faith. And in the next verse, he was worried that some of them would become sexually immoral and unholy like Esau. Verse 16 says, says this, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Esau was the perfect example of someone who failed to obtain the grace of God. He was sexually immoral. Genesis 26 tells us he was intermarried with pagan Canaanites. He therefore was deemed unholy. And he then sold his, his birthright for a bowl of stew. He sold the blessing from his father. Genesis 25, verses 29 through 34, tells us this story. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Enam. Jacob said, Sell me your birth right now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The Lord did not strip this blessing from Esau. Esau gave it away himself for a bowl of stew. And the author is pulling this in because he wants his readers to stay on the pathway that is towards the Lord. He's telling them not to be like Esau. Don't be like Esau, he says. He says, don't give up your birthright. Don't give up your eternal blessing. Don't give in to sexual immorality. And it's interesting that in America, you know, we live in a culture that pushes sexual immorality. It's hard to watch TV and not see something sexual on the screen. I can't even listen to worship music on Spotify on my Roku TV without hearing an ad pushing something sexual. And this is something that the enemy really is using to, to, to deter Christians from pursuing holiness. So many have given up their birthright for sexual immorality. And I believe this is why the Bible speaks a lot on sexual immorality. <clears throat> Don't give up your birthright for the things of this world, sexual immorality or anything. <clears throat> now we saw that Esau gave up his birthright. What happens when you give up your birthright? <laughs> well, the writer of Hebrews tells us in the next verse. Verse 17 says, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. 
when he found out he was deceived by Jacob, <clears throat> Genesis 27, verse 34 tells us he begged for the blessing back. It says this, as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O oh my father. But as we know, the blessing was irrevocable. He could not get that blessing back. He could not get his birthright back. And there was no repentance to be found. The lesson here for the reader of Hebrews and for all of us is that repentance can't always be found. Again, I keep saying this, but it's, it's imperative to what we're learning about today. That Back in chapter 6, the warning against apostasy. There was no restoration for those who fell away. Esau forfeited his blessing. And the author is telling his readers not to forfeit their blessing. Don't forfeit the grace of God over something earthly, he's telling them. Do not become defiled, because when you do, you will find yourself apart from God with no restoration or repentance, and that's a dangerous place to be. He's reminding them to not abandon the Lord, because if you do, there's no repentance, there's no restoration for you. <clears throat> So as we wrap up, I just kind of want to add a little bit more application to how this can, how what we can do as Christians today. I want to make two final points. Some of this I probably have already said, but the first point is the discipline of the Lord. When you think of the discipline of the Lord, remember that it's for your good. Remember that. Don't think of it as the Lord hating you. Remember, He's working it all out for your good. The more we're in our Bibles and the more we're praying, the more we're going to realize that. As parents, when we discipline our own kids, let's also do what the Bible says. Paul says this in Ephesians 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As earthly parents, we have a call to raise our kids up in the discipline of the Lord. And we know that the discipline of the Lord means that he loves us. The same can be said for us. When we raise our children up in the discipline of the Lord, it shows our love for our children. <clears throat> it shows them that we care about them. And they won't realize it right away. None of us do. But as they mature and grow older, they will learn to respect it. And they will learn that it was needed. And another thing, when we raise them up in the discipline of the Lord, it shows that we are, in fact, submitting to the Lord to our Lord and Savior and setting an example for our children. The second point I want to make is that we need to be continuously seeking the grace of God. We need to be continuously following down a path of righteousness, the path of holiness. We need to always be following the Lord. Because when we aren't, we saw what happened to Esau. He lost the blessing from his father. He found no repentance, as the writer says. The same thing can be applied to us today. If you turn your back on the Lord, if you start worshiping the idols of your heart, if you are standing in the face of persecution and you turn your back on the Lord and fall away, there is no repentance to be found. <clears throat> this warning has been, of falling away has been all throughout, shown all throughout the book of Hebrews. The author doesn't want you to fall away. He wants you to lean into the Lord. He wants you to press into the word of God to worship the Lord and the Lord only. No idols, no other gods. Not the idols of your heart, none of that. He doesn't want you to sell your birthright like Esau did. So in closing, I'll end with this. Folks, press into the word of God. Pray daily. Prayer is so important. It's so important to our walk as Christians. I don't pray enough, I'll admit that. And I'm working on that. I'm actually reading a book out there that's on the counter, praying the Bible. Praying to the Lord daily is so essential to our walk. Know the Lord. The Lord's discipline is a sign of his love for us. Know that we have such a blessing given to us from the Lord. The blessing of eternal life. Don't give that up for the things of this world. 
And if, and if and when persecution arises as we are going through trials and tribulations, consider Jesus, the one who suffered for the joy that was set before him. We can and should do the same thing. Remember the joy that is set before us also. We are running a race, and when we finish the race, the reward is so beautiful. The blessing of eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we just, we just thank you for, <clears throat> for, for your discipline, Father. We thank you for your blessing of eternal life. We, we know your discipline at times can be tough, and there's often times that we just don't understand it. But there's many things that we, we don't need to understand. We just need to know that you are in control of everything. You are sovereign, Father. And uh, you're working all things out for our good. Father, I pray for this congregation. We love everyone here. And I pray that you keep us all on the path of righteousness, on the path of holiness, so that we can continue to be mature and be sanctified so that when we meet Christ, we are mature for him, Father. I just, I pray that so much for all of us in here. And Father, I ask, um, <clears throat> as we have a fellowship meal after service, Father, that you bless that, you bless the conversations, and you just continue to fill us all with your Holy Spirit. And I just pray this all in your Son's mighty name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit VintageFaithCicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.